Uh, thank you, Matt. I'm very happy to be here. Um, like Matt said, my name is Dana Scheider. Uh, my talk is going to be a little bit more nuts and bolts than the last one and is going to be Ruby oriented. So it's going to be of most interest probably to the people who are working with Cucumber Ruby. Um, hopefully some of the rest of you will be able to get something out of it as well since I'm going to be focusing on cleaning up step definitions, essentially using object oriented principles. Um, so. Um, I encourage you, if you're not able to follow, to please speak up, um, and I'll be happy to clarify anything as as I go along. Um, but sure, and so um, there should be a few minutes for questions and answers afterwards as well. So, without further ado, um, one one of the things that I've um, spent a lot of time doing is consulting on um, on implementation of Cucumber in organizations. And one of the repeated challenges that I've seen come up is keeping step definitions clean, readable, and maintainable as suites grow. Um, especially using the BDD workflows, you end up iteratively adding to both your app and your step definitions. And step definitions tend not to get the refactoring attention that uh, the app code gets or even that the features themselves get. So I want to go over a few practical suggestions for how to clean up your step definitions as your suite scales, primarily using helper modules. To this end, there are two particular scenarios that I want to look at in particular. One is the introduction of complex conditional logic into step definitions, as I'm sure a lot of us have seen as our step definitions get more complex and as we add parameterized steps, you tend to get more and more if statements, more and more um, case statements or switch statements. Um, and that can get a bit hairy over time and can really, really negatively affect the experience of using Cucumber. So I want to address that issue. And then I also want to address the issue of repetition in step definitions and how we can address that, especially since the functionality of um, calling steps from other step definitions is going to be deprecated in future versions of Cucumber. So the first scenario I want to look at is the issue of conditionals. Um, like I said, this is an issue that a lot of us have run into as our suites have grown. You'll often start out with something innocent like this. Um, I hope you can see this. This is a basic given step, given a user. Uh, we need to create a user at the beginning of um, at the beginning of our scenario, and there's nothing wrong with this step definition. We just assign a user to the user variable and create a user with a username and password. That's simple enough, no problem. But then things start to get more difficult. Within a couple iterations, a lot of the time, we'll find that one type of user is not enough. Uh, most applications are going to have a need for multiple access levels. So within a couple of iterations, we find that we have admin users as well as regular users. And so at that point, we're going to modify our step a little bit to specify a type of user. And within the step definition, that means that we have to add an if statement where we create an admin user if the type is admin and otherwise a regular user. That step could be better, but it's, but it's still not too bad. Things start to get really hairy, though, when we find that we need multiple levels of admins. Uh, in this in this application, we imagine that we have um, that we have accounts that are associated with lower level users. So not only do we have global admins who have access to all accounts, but we also have um, account admins who have access to settings and users that are associated with their account only. That leads to a step definition that looks like this. Uh, we can say when we have a top level admin user, when we have an account admin user, when we have a regular user, and I've seen these statements essentially like this get worse and worse. So what are we going to do about this? Um, the, the cool thing about 
conditional logic is um, whenever you see it in your step definitions, it's a sure sign that you should be thinking about refactoring the definition. Um, this, tends to, this tends to lead to some frustration when, you're, when you have these statements that are just getting ugly like this, you may not know exactly what to do with them and it can start to really negatively affect your experience. So what do we do? For the, for the initial case where you only have an admin and a regular user, you can often just distill this into a one line or an inline if statement into a ternary operator like here and that makes the whole thing a lot more concise and a lot more maintainable. On the other hand, when you get to the case statement, things get a little more complicated. The good news about case statements is that there's often an essentially one size fits all solution to them, and that is data structures. Case statements often are a result of having different values corresponding to different uh, parameters in the steps. And in this case, we can create a helper module, um, the user helper.rb, that maps these access levels to, or that maps the wording to the access level of the user that we need to create. So we can do this using, an, using a module constant called user access level. Um, then when you go to your env.rb file, you can go ahead and include the user helper in the Cucumber world, which enables you to access that a module constant without having to name the user helper module um, as a namespace. Um, in that case, you can end up with the um, step definition that is at the bottom here, where you, instead of having to have the case statement, you can just fetch a value from that module constant, um, create an account if necessary, and then create your user using that, using that access level and account and you've distilled that case statement into a three-line step definition. So that's, that ends up being much more readable, much more manageable. Um, I encourage you, any time that you find yourself having complex conditionals in your step definitions, helper modules with module constants using hashes or sometimes arrays can be invaluable for making those much more, much easier to work with and much easier to scale as you need to add different access levels, as you need, need to add different API keys, different types of users, whatever your case is. So, scenario two. This, this also happens a lot and it happens a lot when you're using Cucumber perfectly correctly. One of the things that we encourage people to do is when you're writing your features, word things as naturally as possible. You don't want to necessarily rely on existing, on existing steps and shoehorn those into your scenarios if it makes them less readable. The downside of this is that it results in having step definitions that are essentially the same. So in this case, we have, we start out with this relatively innocent initial step, a, a given step where, we're, where we need a logged in user. This step definition could be better, and I'll go into a little more detail about that in a minute, but it's basically okay. We have, we're doing a front end test here for a web application, and we want to create a user and then have that user log in using a login form. That's okay. On the other hand, in a, for a different scenario, we may want to introduce a scenario where our when step is when the user logs in. Same basic logic. So what can we do? We can duplicate that essential code in the step definition for the user logs in. Most of us are not going to be satisfied with this solution. And Luckily, well seemingly luckily, Cucumber offers an out of the box solution to this that um, many of us, myself included, have made liberal use of in the past. We can clean that up a bit by calling the first step in the second step. 
the problem is that that's not a particularly flexible solution. It's not particularly object oriented. And in a most practical sense, this approach will no longer be available in future versions of Cucumber. So what can we do about this? Again, helper modules can provide an answer for this uh, that turns out to be much more flexible and contribute much better to readability and maintainability of the steps since they don't require you to rely on one step being the same as another. So this is again, once you have these, you, you get multiple step definitions and things, it, and it ends up negatively affecting your experience of using Cucumber. I've seen this happen a lot. So in this case, we can create this login helper that extracts a login user method. That will encapsulate all of the login logic where you visit the page and you fill out the login form and you submit it. Um, again, we can include that in our login in our Cucumber world, and then call that method from our step definition uh, in both step definitions. In that case, you end up with two much more concise steps that are decoupled from one another, and in my opinion, are much more readable than the, than the step definition that simply calls another step. You have the additional benefit that in the, that in the first step, a user needs to be created um, given a logged in user, whereas in the second step, when the user logs in, there's already a user in the system. That way, instead of using a conditional assignment, we can simply create a user in the one step and leave that out of the other. So these are, this essentially covers the two scenarios that I wanted to go into in discussing helper modules, and I find that these constitute a large majority of the ugly step definitions that I see when I'm working with people on, on cleaning up their cucumber steps and scaling their um, features. So one of the important takeaways here is simply that step definitions need to be maintained and do need to be refactored. Um, if only this fit into the BDD cycle, right? It's not like we have a refactor stage. Um, so yes, when you, when you do your refactor stage, which um, I'm hoping that everyone does, do look at your features as well as your step definitions and see how you can modify those to make them more scalable, make them more readable, more maintainable. Um, the second takeaway, that I want to emphasize is that helper modules are an extremely important aspect of Cucumber Suites that are neglected too often, especially, um, especially as a way of storing data. Um, keeping the data structures in module constants is a very common sense solution that I see used very infrequently. Um, using these simple approaches, you can create step definitions that are that sound natural, that are decoupled from one another, and are more maintainable than the way that they were before. Um, lastly, Cucumber uses, Cucumber uses DSLs, and DSLs often end up in, in practice neglected when it comes to object-oriented principles. We often throw those right out the window as soon as we um, as soon as we have a DSL and we introduce procedural code. But you, but you can, and I would argue, should continue to look for ways to apply object orientation to your Cucumber step definitions to make them, again, more maintainable and more readable, as well as providing more flexibility in your suites. So those are essentially the takeaways that I would, that I would like people to get from this talk. Um, at this point, are there any questions? Yes. Um, Matt? <laughs> All right.
Here we go. Hi. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, uh, when I discovered helper modules a while back, when I was still in the Ruby world, it was like the heavens opened. It was fantastic. <laughs> it um, really is. It's broadly applicable to any OO Glue language, I'd say. Sorry, could you repeat the it's question? It's broadly applicable as an approach to any of the OO languages underpinning, underpinning Cucumber. Yeah, my experience is um, almost exclusively with the, with the Ruby implementation, but we do try to keep features relatively consistent across implementations, so there, sh so there will be um, analogous or essentially analogous structures that are available in the other implementations of Cucumber as well. Hi. Um, what's the thought process of removing um, steps calling other steps? Sorry, what was... Sorry. What's the thought process of removing the um, steps calling steps? The steps quoting steps. Yes, so I'll go back to that. Um, in this case, so what this looks like is you end up having one step definition and then another one has this step keyword with um, with the name of the other step the, or the wording of the other step in quotations. And the question is, why are we taking it away? Oh, why are we taking it away? Okay, yeah. yes, I see. Um, the, well, part of the reason, and, um, and I can't speak for the other maintainers here, but to me, one of the, one of the key reasons for this is that it lacks flexibility and it couples steps too tightly to one another. So in this case, for instance, this step called given a logged in user, that the process for creating a logged in user might change and then the user logs in step could break. Whereas if we have helper modules with methods, um, with methods that you can call, that becomes a lot more flexible and you don't end up with more repetition, but you do end up having, an, having a more flexible way to, call, to um, dry up your code to eliminate that repetition. Um, so I think that, that was, that's for me an important rationale for that change. We've seen people get themselves into real messes, so it's kind of one of those things where people are irresponsible to just take it away. Thanks. Um, if modules are good, and they are, um, I've used them and they make things nicer, are classes better? <laughs> that's, well, that's a, that's a whole other can of worms, and you can, and you can really use both. Um, you can introduce arbitrary support code into into cucumber um, into cucumber helpers. Um, one really popular use of that is page objects, which I didn't go into at all. But classes can be really useful when you're testing a front end web app to encapsulate logic like like this login form. You could um, you could just as well create a a login page object that has this method. At, instead, um, and in some languages, modules aren't available in the same way. So for instance, in Java, you would, you would use classes instead. Um, so, so yes, there are, there are definitely more than, one way to, more than one way to skin that cat. I don't recommend skinning cats, but, um, <laughs> but there are definite, definitely multiple ways to do it if you can, and you know, if you feel a desire. And they can be, yeah, they can be equally useful as far as using object-oriented principles and encapsulating logic. Yes. You said that when we uh, start to write a DSL but for use in the step definitions that often we neglect object-oriented principles and fall into writing procedural code in those? Yes. Um, seeing as how procedural thinking is the easiest for humans naturally, mm -hmm. why as object-oriented domain-specific languages, why are they better than having procedural um, uh, type code in the step definitions? 
Um, my, my experience with, with Ruby in particular, which is my primary language, is that a certain amount of procedural code is necessary. I mean, those of us who have written, um, that have written Ruby apps, especially those that don't use Rails, we end up having some kind of a startup script that is quite procedural. And in your step definitions, especially if you have uh, multiple actions that need to happen within a given step, um, such as creating the user and logging in the user um, or taking, you know, taking additional actions to set things up in given steps especially. Um, you do end up with a certain amount of procedural code, but object orientation is helpful in that it can help that code be more readable and it can help keep the, it can help keep it, um, things, keep it easier to not repeat the code unnecessarily. Um, the thing about repeated code is that besides being not readable and not maintainable, which is the primary rationale that we often hear for not repeating code, the reality is that the more lines of code you have, the more opportunity you have to introduce bugs. And that's just as true with uh, test code as it is with app code. So the more that you can encapsulate that logic in objects um, and you know, in functional programming, it's different. But right now, uh, right now, all of our implementations are in object-oriented languages. Um, so the more that you can encapsulate that in objects, the less repetition you have, and the fewer lines of code you need. So that reduces the likelihood that you're going to be introducing errors. Got that, everyone? <laughs> Good. Well. We were running a bit behind schedule, but we've kind of caught up there. So unless anybody has a really burning question. I mean, that, Brian, it seems like quite a deep question in a way. And there's a big theme here about sort of organizing the code between the feature files and the application. We've seen quite a lot of talks about that today. And I hope that's something that we'll be exploring more over the next couple of days. Um, so what I want to do right now is uh, give Dana a really big thank you.